Uh, tonight I'm joined by Uncle Bruce Pascoe and Tammy Gilson and hopefully Uncle Dave. Um, and this panel is has such an incredible wealth of knowledge of country, of fire, um, and for, for the future of country management or country care. Um, management is not the best term. So... For me, my background is as an, is as an archaeologist, and when I think about fire and humans, you know, I think about fire and humans going hand in hand. And for humanity, fire has led us to who we are, and has significantly shaped the world in which we live. Fire is, to me, it's many things. It's beautiful. It's cleansing, and fire has the capacity to heal. But fire is also incredibly dangerous. And we, all of us here, have bore witness to that danger um, through the destruction of sacred country, the loss of life and sanctuary, uh, especially recently during the Black Summer fires. Even if you weren't on country that was burned, the smoke enveloped our cities far from the fire front, taking over 400 lives and affecting 80% of the population of Australia. Catastrophic wildfires, are a result of the removal of people from country. And I think, um, you know, we're here in Design Week and I really wanted to shift the audience's focus from country, um, sorry, shift the audience's focus to country and to all parts of this continent as being designed of really getting rid of this idea of wilderness, of getting rid of this idea that there are places that have been untouched. No place has been untouched. No place has not been cared for and loved over millennia. Um, so, yeah, so I guess what I'm asking and what I'm entreating tonight is that you all start thinking of landscapes as being constructed. And through this, in, this panel, we will explore construction through fire. So we're meeting today on Wurundjeri country and um, this morning when I walk to work, I walk through, um, you know, the suburban streets of Melbourne, but there's avenues of gum trees. And what I could hear this morning was the chirping of rainbow lorikeets and that beautiful sun shining through those trees and thinking about all of the ways in which those trees nourish the world around them, including the birds, but also me in, in, in traversing through country. And so in that way, I'd like to acknowledge Wurundjeri country. I'd like to acknowledge how it holds us and how it keeps us safe and how it needs us, all of us as stewards of country to take care of it. And I want to acknowledge the countries that people have come from who have, tra who have traveled here today um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And hopefully Uncle Dave will be here later um, to talk further on his country. Um, but that's okay. Um, so I guess thinking about fire, cultural fire, for many of us as Indigenous people, it's a journey. And Tammy, I thought I could go to you first to talk about that journey of cultural fire. Um, and we were speaking before about you... Uh, traveling to Cape York, was it? And, you know, um, and that sort of how we're building networks of cultural fire practitioners. And so I was wondering if you could just tell me about how, a little bit about your journey in cultural fire. Thanks, Maddie. Um, that's on, yes. First of all, I just want to acknowledge Nam and acknowledge um, the Wiwurrung and the Bumurrung people and acknowledge all of you here, especially the elders that are in the audience and our elder sitting here today with us. Um, so I guess my journey with fire started back in 2014 uh, when I had the privilege to work on a, a, a project called the Wimmera Yungaramala, which is the fire spirit return. And it was funded through the National Land Care Program and uh, with the CCMA. So we got to travel to Cape York and um, we went with Uncle Dave actually and that's where I met him and um, we went up there with the Taipan people and yeah, we, we camped and we learnt about fire and for me that was really the turning point that really ignited my passion with fire and I thought this is really what I need to base my knowledge around and um, really grow from that and 
and that's I guess why I'm here today <laughs> I guess through that journey and um, the layers of knowledge and the elders that I have spoken with and um, learnt from that have really uh, really strengthened me as an Aboriginal person um, and uh, sorry I really want to acknowledge my mum Auntie Marlene Gilson and my nan um, who's who's passed and my family that are here today as well that um, uh, kindly support me in uh, the work that I do but fire for me is healing it is central for our well-being uh, it, is, it is really it's something that our country is calling out for and it is really vital that we um, you know, keep these conversations going and see where they take us into the future. Hello. Ah, <laughs> here I am. Um, thank you, Tammy. And uh, I mean, for me, thinking about, you know, that that journey is ongoing, but it's it's rooted in these ancient ways of knowing and the ways in which country tell us what it needs and what it's looking for. Um, I think, Uncle Bruce, I, you know, your work is so uh, foundational for many people in broadening their understanding of country and the complexities of culture. So I guess um, I've got many questions to ask you, <laughs> but I, first of all, I think um, I'd like to go a little bit into talking about contemporary fire regimes and thinking about the ways in which, and Tammy, you work at DELP, so I'd also like for you to respond to this as well, but thinking about the way in which we do plan burns and we can, you know, this fuel reduction, this uh, focus on fuel reduction. When um, I've been, you know, I read, like Uncle Bruce, I do a lot of uh, historic research being an archaeologist um, and reading about uh, explorers and, and colonisers coming onto country and they talk about burning in during summer and these big burns during summer and from my sort of knowledge of the way in which we do fuel reduction burns, they're done in the cooler months in different times of the year. And so, Uncle Bruce, I wanted to ask you about what effect the changed fire regime has had on 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 our food, on our on the, on our plants, really. And, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Bunurong, you and and Tasmanian man. Cornish and English. Um, I know a lot about my family and I'm very proud of them, uh, all of them. Um, I would like to acknowledge you, sis, and unc at the back there, and you, uh, Maddie, because I know what you both do and it's very important for us. Um, I'm very grateful that you are doing that work. Australia's got a really um, warped understanding of its history. Um, very hard for Australians to acknowledge the theft and the murder. Um, you know, something that we're going to have to get over and not, um, not finesse it, not, you know, eventually coming around in a big circle and said, well, you had it coming to you. You know, you, um, you deserved it um, because you weren't us you know, being the, the European. Um, that's still going on. That sentiment, that psychology is still happening. The Prime Minister can't apologise without saying, and now it's up to you to forgive. Um, you know, that's not an apology. That's not acknowledging what has happened uh, to us. Um, so the, Australia is still forming its understanding of this continent. Um, after you've, after you've stolen something, you have to hide it so no one else knows that you stole it. So that knowledge is hidden because, you, you know, because of the theft. Um, and only now, and uh, as a result of a lot of young people, I think, um, both black and white, um, that understanding is starting to happen in Australia. And it's kind of inexorable now that um, we're, on this, we're on this road now and there'll be some people... Uh, who will, will resist it, and I know very well about that resistance um, and about the methods that will be used to resist, but uh, it's, it's underway, 
and it can't be stopped now. Uh, young people in particular um, want to know more about their food, they want to know more about their country, they want to know more about who they are. And so, you know, um, that secret's out of the box now and it can't go, it can't be put back in. It concerns me um, about fire and it also concerns me that we separate fire and water. Um, you know, the two are, are the same. Um, we treat them both um, with equal importance and uh, as combinations of each other. But it concerns me with um, cultural burning um, that we, we think that fire is going to be good for all country at the same time. And, you know, Victor Stephenson has done an incredible job for this country, um, both with his book and his work. But a lot of our, our people come back from Queensland and try to burn country like Queensland burns country. Um, and it's not right for our country. There were parts of our country that were probably hardly ever burnt. Um, and that country remained unburnt because the country around it was burnt. Um, I'm thinking of mountain ash forests. Um, you know, they, they don't survive fire. And there, there's a reason for it. Uh, they're not used to it. Over 100,000 years of human occupation of the place and our people say we've always been here. Uh, so, you know, 60,000 years, 100,000 years, it's a blink of an eye anyway. Um, but over that period of time, forests, animals uh, get used to a certain environment and that environment includes fire. So our country is adapted to the climate of this country and its variations, but it's also adapted to the application of fire by our people. Uh, this, we, Aboriginal people, we changed Australia, um, but we changed it in a, with a consciousness of who she was, of who, the, who this earth was, and we did it with respect for her, not a, in opposition to her. Um, and there's a real difference between those two things. Watching the tree, and understanding the tree spirit and then the way we the way we behave in front of that tree are very important things and we we cannot touch the tree without asking permission and we have to understand that the tree is us and we're the tree and we're the bird and we're the possum and we're the soil and the stone you know this is not just sentimental rubbish this is environmental imperative that's who we are and that's how we that's how we ought to treat um, mother earth i think um thank you for that i think um what i'm hearing is that systemic trauma that is um that is born into us um and that's something that we as aboriginal people are always fighting, like we're always trying to, um, I guess, prove who we are. Um, and for me, it's a bit hard because my skin's not dark, but, I, you know, I carry that same spirit, you know, like that tree that Uncle's talking about. But, um, you know, it's very difficult. The work that I do, uh, so I work at DELP, which is the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Um, I work as an Aboriginal Partnerships Coordinator and the cultural burning work that I do is in my spare time, pretty much. And uh, my nephew's the fire officer at Wadarung Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation. And, yeah, we've been working um, and trying to... We, we get approached from a lot of landowners, um, a lot of government agencies that are saying, oh, we want you to come and do burns on our, on our land. And, and we're saying that we, we're not ready for that yet. Like we're still, you know, reading our country. We need to map our country. We need to understand the ecosystems, the different, you know, the diversity on, on our country. Um, and we need to have that understanding before we can go out and write these burn programs because if we don't have that knowledge base behind that, there's no point. And what we're always saying is they have areas allocated for fuel reduction burns and um, they're wanting us to do cultural burning there and 
you know, for me, I don't like to even call it cultural burning anymore because the word culture, I feel, is being stripped from us as Aboriginal people. We're calling it fire sticks and that, that takes it back and that means that us as Aboriginal people can call it fire sticks and we own that. So it's all about really us getting back and taking control, having self-determination and, and driving that, having that voice so that we're heard. And um, it's very, very important that mapping is the very beginning of it. I mean, um, we've got a fire sticks workshop coming up for the women in two weeks uh, that I've been supported with from Fire Sticks Alliance. And that's the first time in Victoria that we've had a women's camp. And we're, we're sort of leading the way, with, <laughs> apart from the men. But um, we've invited representatives. We've got uh, Peter Stanley coming down from Cape York. We've got women coming there from all over Victoria, uh, from each different mob. So we can all share these ideas. And from those ideas, then we can grow together. And then we, in May, we've got a Tasmanian camp coming up that I've been invited to. So, um, you know, for us, we're really empowering ourselves and... Um, We've just put our some of our uh, Wadarung people through some fire training so they can get the accreditation because what we're finding when it's dope managed land that we need an accreditation, you need PPE, you can't just go and light a match. You sort of, there's all these policy and restrictions around that. Um, but it's sort of, you know, that's our avenue in. And I think that they're listening to us now. We're sort of like the times are changing. And I feel that now we've, we've got a, We've got a patch of land that we own, um, Bale Water. We bought a, a property down at the Bostock at Balan. And that's the first for our mob to actually own something that um, was taken away from us. And, you know, and I, I mean taken away from us. And that's the pain that my nan and my grandmother, they never got to experience anything what we do now. And it's really, really important that we, are, we you know, continue this and keep learning from one another. And, you know, coming tonight to these sort of talks, that's the beginning of, um, you know, for those of you who don't know much about, about cultural burning, it's really, you know, it's the beginning for you to start learning. And then you can tell, you know, your children and pass that on about how important it is for us as Aboriginal people to be doing this um, and together in unity. Thanks, Hammy. Um, reflecting on, on that and... I really resonated with uh, this I, this sort of um, feeling that often people get really excited and they say yes let's let's burn and it's and it's kind of like whoa like you know there's this whole process of of relearning of reclamation but then also we need to acknowledge what has happened to country and over the past two hundred years and that we can't always just go straight in with traditional burning methodologies because often they're not even our plants anymore they're not, it's, the country has changed so much that you know there needs to be something that happens to to get country to a point in which we can start to care for it in the ways in which we know and that space and that time and that grace to be able to do that is something that um I've certainly felt the that that I felt um, inadequate to be able to ask for that. Um, and I think that's really important. And um, I know there's lots of researchers in the room and we think about these tight timeframes of research and getting things done and, and government is about strategic plans and doing things. But that time and that space for those conversations are so important. And I was wondering, Uncle Bruce, if those sorts of conversations, you know, up in Malakuta around how does it... What does it take to get country to a point where we can start to really care for it again if you've been having those sorts of conversations? Yeah, well, the, the town is having those conversations because uh, 160 houses lost in Malakuta. Um, it's changed the psychology of the town and we can't do anything without understanding how people now think in the town. Um, uh, my wife, Lynn, um, <coughs> was in the fire shed when it caught a light uh, during the Malakuta fires. And it, she was first on the ground with recovery uh, of a plan to re recover the town after the fire. So it's been, you know, two years, two and a half years of really hard 
hard work. L Lynn had begun um, before the fire began. We all knew it was coming. We just didn't know exactly what day. But be long before it had uh, come, Lynn was looking at a, a, a way of planning the safety of the town in the forest because it's surrounded by a national park. And uh, we're both in the CFA, um, which is a boys' organisation that allows women into it, um, but has complete contempt for those women most of the time. Um, so Lynn has devoted her life to this and been treated really badly. Um, just putting that on the record. Um, but what happened after the fire, um, uh, I, m my farm is at Wallagra River, and so we were out of the immediate fire zone. It hit like a bomb, and it was gas. It wasn't burning logs. It was gas that exploded and then set fire to everything else. And um, I was out of that section of the fire. The fire at Malakuta was done and dusted in 24 hours, um, and on the farm it lasted for five, six weeks. And, um, you know, that has its own psychological effect on you. Um, but what disturbed um, me was having lost our crops because we'd put a lot of work into it. And I, I was feeling sorry for the community, but Mother Earth showed me something really important, showed us all something really important. I didn't lose my house. So, you know, when you've got a base, uh, when you've got your own teacups and table, uh, you're at a huge advantage to people who haven't. So we had time to think. Um, we lost our crop of kangaroo grass and spear grass. With, within days of the first rain, we had um, what we call Mamaja Naluk dancing grass, Michaelinus depoides. Um, it was a minority plant on our farm. It became the, the dominant crop as a result of that fire. But then gradually uh, we got wallaby grass, uh, more spear grass, kangaroo grass. They all came back. But the stunning thing was that we also got orchids and we got lilies and we got mernong. Um, all of these plants, that we'd also got rid of our, our cattle. Um, and so all of these things were there waiting to grow. Um, the fire wasn't hot enough to kill the soil. Um, they all came back with the first rain. And the, the country is transformed. Um, I'm not recommending that you have a, um, you know, a fire of that in intensity, but it did teach us a lesson. But what we had been trying to do even before the fire started was to get back to the Aboriginal forest. Uh, that's roughly 10 to 12 uh, trees to the acre. You know, that's a rule of thumb. You know, uh, some countries might have had five trees to the other acre. Some might have had 100. It depends on the forest, depends on Mother Earth, you know. But as a rule of thumb in dry sclerophyll forests, it used to be 10 to 12 to the acre, roughly. Um, we're trying to go back to that now. All of Australian forests, the, the forest around Malakut is said to be pristine. That's a lot of bullshit. You know, it's been logged three times and it's been logged again. Um, this is not a pristine forest. The trees, I counted 330 trees to the acre on one, um, and I use acres, not hectares, because I'm that old and I'm allowed to. Um, 330 trees to the acre, um, and they're, 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 they're within a, a metre and a half of each other, these stems. They're that big, and they're grown for wood pulp. This is not a natural forest. And in national parks, you may not... Hey, my brother. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I was ringing you. <laughs> Hey, look out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, keep your eye on me. Yeah, so the, those trees were, you know, cheek by jowl and they set a light to each other and caused the, the conflagration that became that big fire. If they had been separated uh, further, um, we wouldn't have had a dangerous fire. 
uh, because the old people had designed it that way. You know, see how I got back to the question? Design. We, we had designed the forest so that it couldn't catch a light. And there was a section of the forest where there, we, we had a, roughly that um, number of trees and they were huge. They were massive trees. And when I could hear the fire coming um, from up the Malakuta Lakes, coming up to the top of the hill, it sounded like a train. And I you know, thought, it's time to go. So, but I looked around at those trees and I said, I'll, I'll come back in the morning and you'll still be here and I'll still be here and we'll recognise each other. And that's exactly what happened. Those trees were the only live trees in that forest the next morning. They were too big to burn. And what's happening now, um, going along all the roadsides and, uh, in East Gippsland, they are cutting down all the big trees. They cut down Uncle Max's motel. Uh, the tree that he and his grandfather used to sleep in um, in the 1950s, 1960s. They cut that tree down uh, because it was supposed to be a killer tree when in fact it was a living tree. Um, and we've got the... You know, we have our conception of forest arse about. We think we've got to cut out the big trees. What we've got to do is cut out the little trees. So. We've got young people, young Yuan men, some Nyampa men working on the, the farm. We're employing um, a couple of young Aboriginal women as well. Um, and our aim, apart from growing the yams and the grasses, um, is to bring our forest back to the old design. So that means we're cutting down trees. They're straight poles. We hope to be able to sell them and uh, we, but it, the plan is 70 years and I said to the young fella who's doing most of the work in that part of the forest, I said, you will have to write something down for your great grandchildren because they're going to see this forest and you won't be here, I certainly won't, um, but you need to write something down so that they know what you had in mind because that's how long it's going to take, 70 years minimum, um, before we can change the forest back. Um, you know, governments only think three years ahead, um, but we have, to have a, um, uh, we have to have a plan uh, that is uh, seven decades long, and we have to stick to it, and we the people um, have to insist that they stick to it and not change it just because um, someone has a deal with Japan uh, to cut down our forest, to render into pulp, so that we can have hamburger wrappers. Yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, Uncle Bruce, all of those stories that you were telling, for me, resonated so much. So I grew up in King Lake and I was 17 when Black Saturday happened and I was living there at the time and we evacuated and... My parents have the most beautiful property. It's 120 acres. I use acres too. Um, and it's half bushland, half uh, paddocks for horses and alpacas and whatever else my mother has bought from the <laughs> market. Um, and every single blade of grass and every single fence post and every single leaf burnt that day except for the house and one meter around it and I think my mother was very upset because insurance would have been much better if the house had have gone and, and the forest had have stayed but you know that was 12 years ago and thinking about what has changed and what hasn't changed and then the good and the bad that's come out of that and the good and the bad that's going to come out of the Black Summer fires and that has already come out of the Black Summer fires. And I think the early warning systems for life is that we had no, we didn't know, we had no idea until the paddock was on fire. There was not anything then. Um, and now many of us have the Vic Emergency app on our phone and it's going off as soon as somebody drops a cigarette butt. Um, but in, on the flip side of that, what that has allowed and what happened afterwards and Uncle Bruce is probably similar in Malakuta was the, um, like you were talking with the hotel, was this wanton almost destruction of, of country because it's un, unsafe and, and who's 
markers are unsafe and what does that mean um, is, you know, I think that that sort of urgency of action without thought is really dangerous, not only, you know, to us as Aboriginal people seeing firstly the destruction through catastrophic wildfire that could have been prevented and then the destruction through its the management of it. Um, and then also for, for those wildlife, you know, that that was something that uh, was really difficult. My have a, I've always had a liar bird that talks to me. And when I go for walks on my parents' property, which backs onto the National Park, and I follow the waterways through there, I normally walk with a liar bird following me around or flitting through the trees. And they they survived because they laid down into in those waterways. But you know, that was really lucky, whereas a lot of, there was this, this huge loss of wildlife, which we feel quite keenly in them taking away their uh, habitats. And so that long winded, I'm just, I'm just inserting myself in the panel. <laughs> um, but Tammy, I guess um, we've spoken a bit about language in the past and uh, language for me holds many keys. Indigenous languages are not like English. They are far more descriptive and rich. And so when I'm looking at language words or I'm talking to people who hold language, uh, we get these little hints at ways in which country needs to be cared for through language. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, I guess um, our language for us is part of our identity of who we are. Um, and what we're seeing now is we've got a healthy country plan that we're um, now having opportunities to rename some of our places on country. There's um, a park in Ballarat that Uncle Brian named, um, we've called Wubukarang. So we put language back into that area. But normally the language is um, identifies the place, the country, can identify the people's names that lived there or the, the, you know, the plants and the animals. It always has to give reference to a particular place or a water, a living waters. Um, but yeah, for us, the language is really important and we'd like to see all of our you know, our waterways and places, um, you know, bring that language back. Um, but that's happening now. And, um, you know, even at, at DELP, they're wanting to name their meeting rooms in language, which, um, you know, you can take that two ways if you <laughs> if you choose. But I guess it's all that acknowledgement. And that's what we're really after is acknowledging the past and what was there, looking at that cultural landscape and thinking, yeah, well, actually, you know, it really makes sense now. It gives that place a purpose and it gives us a purpose. It actually, I don't know, it's so enriching when, um, you know, I did a flow study with my cousin um, on our waterways a couple of years ago, but that really opened my eyes as to, you know, how I saw country and, um, you know, and then I just um, completed a, a course at Nakiri last year. But, but doing that, that sort of... Um, I had to do that to sort of advance myself in a way that um, could be recognised um, and listened to, I guess. Like, we're always trying to prove, I said before, of who we are. And, um, you know, the language is the identity. And we're relearning our language. I get requests, um, you know, from agencies that are wanting to use our language. And I'm saying, no, you can't use our language because our elders, they haven't learned that language yet. Like, we're still learning. We've got so much to learn and... Um, as uncle said here, like I probably won't, you know, get there in my lifetime either. Um, but the, my, you know, my daughter sitting here, like she's, you know, she's in a really good position at the moment that she will carry that legacy on. Um, and yeah, I guess for me, like, um, it's, it's important, but it's, so I like to use language. I'm a, I'm a weaver. So I like to weave my journey in life, I guess. And, um, you know, it's always got different obstacles and a different, it's different learning about different grasses to weave with and how we use our natural dyes and things like that. But I'm like, like, um, like to sort of reintroduce the language words for those grasses and, um, and, you know, and learn what that means and learn that whole process. So then sort of that knowledge is built upon, then we can apply that to different areas and, um, yeah. Yeah. 
I learned to weave over the lock, I don't know which lockdown, one of the lockdowns, um, maybe one of the first ones. And I learned to weave on Zoom using raffia. Um, <laughs> so, and uh, it was sort of a, a, um, Arnie Bronwyn from Gunditch Mara. And um, she was teaching us over Zoom and, you know, we're on this Zoom call for hours and I ended up with something this big. And and since then, you know, my fingers have been red raw weaving. Um, but weaving for me, I, I, you know, I haven't actually collected grass and gone through the process of, um, of, of readying that for weaving and for creating. But thinking about that process of, of, of creating a basket or, or whatever really talks to me about this slow, slowing down. We're in this hyper-consumerism world and, uh, you know, we get what we want now, but weaving, I mean, how long does it take for you to weave, t- Tammy? Like it, for me, it's hours of, of work to get something quite small. Um, maybe you're a bit faster than me and I'm watching TV as I do it normally. <laughs> um, but I would, could you just give us a quick like rundown of the process of weaving? Because I think it would be really useful for people to understand something that, you know, a basket might be quite a utilitarian item, but it has such a huge process from collection to the drying to the creation and, and then the opportunity to talk you know sitting on zoom with Arnie Bronwyn and and all those Aboriginal women just yarning while we're you know um, weaving I was wondering if you could talk us through the process yeah I guess I'll bring that back to fire um and yeah it's working <laughs> but I guess um you know we talk about men's and women's business and um you know if we bring that back to areas that we collected our grasses from they're the places that we uh managed or safeguarded i guess and you know we applied fire to those areas not just for the grasses but for food and other reasons but um you know from from that process about and then actually having you know burning at the right time um is really important and particular places is really important It's, it's and it's different across country but i guess from collecting it and um, I learned from two aunties, um, Wumurang elders actually, um, and they're in Tasmania and sadly one's passed, which um, I pay my respects to the family. Um, but yeah, th- they sat down with me and took me under their wing and um, said I was like their granddaughter. And um, yeah, they sat down with me and the process is, is we pick one year and we strip it and then we tie it in sort of bundles and hang it up for the next year. So then you've got your filler. Um, but what I do nowadays is I uh, take mine and I let it dry out for three days and I use the dry stuff as the filler in the middle and then I use the fresher stuff that's been out for a couple of days. But you can soak that in some warm water or it depends on different plants and the different process. But it really, and there's certain times to be doing that as well. Um, and like I'm still discovering that too, and um, I love flax. <laughs> like I've got, I've planted so much flax in my garden. Um, but you know, the native flax that grows down in um, Berenboke as well for us is, you know, it's a bit shorter, but it takes a long time to weave that. But you know, if you strip it really finely, you can get this really beautiful silk thread. And um, I've just learned last year that my great grandfather from my English side, um, he was Welsh. And he was a basket weaver and mum dug up a photo and gave it to me and he's woven this great big massive basket and he used to weave for his family um, and sell the, you know, the baskets to buy food. So I feel very blessed that I've got it from both sides and um, it's a certain type of magic and when we talk about, you know, managing country, the women, you know, with our digging sticks that hold that certain type of magic that we always carried um, through life. And, and when we pass, it went with us. Um, but, you know, and it's like my hands. I don't know what happens, but um, I really love relating that back to agriculture and connecting our fire to the water um, and weaving. Um, I've woven a few big eel traps, um, the Bunia Binek. And, um, you know, that, that whole learning for me is just really, oh, it's fantastic. I love it. Um, yeah, and that really speaks to me about that it's not, you know, when we think about public land and this, this 
cultural burning it's often you know they want to ship the black fellas in to do the burning and then walk away but it's this ongoing relationship it's for our cultural uh sustenance as well that we have access to materials and we're able to partake further than burning that it's about all of these elements coming together um and i think that's something that this siloing of cultural burning cultural water or cultural resource management um they don't see these they kind of silo them off and it's different people that you deal with but really it's part of this this whole cycle um and that the the basket weaving is just as important as the cultural burning because it's all part of the same cycle um uncle bruce i was wondering um and sorry my questions are kind of getting a bit like um but it's it's such a fantastic opportunity to have you both here and i've really appreciated everything that you've both you've both brought to the table um and i you know we've spoken a little we've spoken about the present and about what we're we're all doing and we've spoken a little bit about the future and and really this plan that we need to be thinking about these generations in the future um and Uncle Bruce, your work has kind of illuminated the past uh, in many different ways. And so, um, yeah, I, I kind of, this, this, this day is about the construction of a landscape through fire, but I don't think we've really discussed about how our old people did that and with, you know, in pieces. And so I wonder if you could maybe introduce us to that a little bit, um, particularly through the work that you've done around food and, um, you know, how those landscapes of, of bounty are constructed. Um, well, fire is um, so important to them, um, obviously, but I'm just talking about, you were talking about um, Bronwyn. Um, well, I used to supply grass to all the old ladies in the Western District. Um, I'm glad you laughed because it was a joke, you know, grass. Uh, <clears throat> but um, the, all those old basket weavers, um, I lived at Cape Otway. We had a lot of lamandra. Um, it was big, strong, wide lamandra. And uh, it was a long, long one. We also had the uh, Tasman flax lily, short one, fine one. Um, but I used to uh, collect... Uh, those plants off my property and take them to the old ladies and sit down with um, Arnie Zelda, who was Bronwyn's mum. And I would always take um, young uh, Aboriginal girls or boys um, to sit down while she, she was weaving or preparing the grass because she'd always talk. And she always said she had no language. And, um, but if I mispronounced a word, she would always pull me up and I say to her aunt, I, I thought you didn't know any language. She said, I know when you say it wrong. Um, <laughs> but it, that was a, a wonderful relationship for us to, to do that. And I was, um, I was looking forward to Uncle Dave being here um, because I, there's a story I want to share with him, um, but I need to talk to him about it first. But um, those old relationships are... Um, fire is so important to them um, because those old plants, they can get too old. You know, these are Australian plants. They've been used to interaction with our people for so long that we've altered their genome. They have become family to us. And so if we don't burn them, those plants are not themselves. They, they change with our use of fire. And um, flax lily in particular... Um, it, if you don't burn it, you can't use the, the grass for weaving because it gets too woody. And the same with the lamandra. Um, we, we need to keep that grass growing green. And we've, we've been doing cultural burning. We, you know, we don't call it cultural burning. We just use our name for fire. Um, and... Last winter, we burnt a section, which wasn't very big. We were a little bit disappointed because we're, you know, we're still new to using this method. Um, we, we're doing it with full respect. We, do it, we open it with ceremony, 
um, and then we, we burn. But we don't know everything there is to a, about it. And when you say that in non-Aboriginal community, they think you're an idiot um, because, you know, they're expecting us to know everything about Aboriginality and we don't. Uh, but we burnt a section last winter. We were a bit disappointed that it didn't go far enough and you should see it now. It stands out in the paddock. You, you can, it's a kilometre from the house, but you can stand at the kitchen window and you can tell exactly where we burnt uh, because of the incredible growth. It was such a good lesson for us. And we, we've been growing lilies for the last three years now. And the vegetable from the lilies is to die for, really. You know, I'm not overrating it by saying it tastes like champagne. It, it, is, it is a wonderful food and everyone's going to be eating it but the hard thing for Australia is going to be to recognise that it's an Aboriginal plant and that the proceeds and the acknowledgement has to go to Aboriginal people. That's what Australia finds really hard. And, you know, um, I, I just can't say enough. Um, you can't eat our food if you can't swallow our history. You can't have one without the other. Um, Australia has found it really hard to thank, thank Aboriginal people for the land um, and this is a way of doing it now. We're on the brink of it now and like you mob there, you know, you're going to see this. How does Australia uh, pay respect to Mother Earth but to also the people who looked after Mother Earth for so long? How do we do that? Um, and, you know, we, there are people running around now doing cultural burning. There's not an Aboriginal person amongst them. You know, they, um, that's a theft. You know, this is a way for Aboriginal people to be recognised, to be employed. You know, there's no such thing as blackfella time. Our people worked hard. If you, you see the... We were talking about Burrawarrina, Ayunk, and the fish traps, and um, all the work involved in that. You know, our people didn't sit down and do nothing. Our people worked hard, and we have to recognise that work. We have to tell our kids there's no black fella time. You know, it's just time, and you're going to have to work. Um, and you know, you don't work at the same job, you know, ten hours a day and uh, like that but you work and you know our people were smart they did lots of things in a day and you couldn't get bored doing any of them uh, that's true work um, but it's also work for your family you're getting f food for your family you're singing and dancing with your family and all of those things are really important important and you I can't separate the song from the fire or the fire from the plant or the plant from the water when we tell these stories, they're whole stories. They're about family. And I'd, I'd love to tell you the, the story of, about the white orchid that lovers used to pick for each other, um, but I can't. Um, <laughs> now I'm just thinking, what's that story? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess Tammy... You know, thinking all of what Unc just said about working hard, but for me, it's it's about community as well, and like we're doing things together, and it's about sharing stories, and it's about that re that reinforcing of of um, community. How is that happening today? Because I know what are doing, and you're doing so much in this space. How are we bringing, making sure that it's the community at the centre of of these, you know, uh, reclamation practices? Well, yeah, we have um, registered Aboriginal parties um, in Victoria who have corporations and, um, you know, that's a place where traditional custodians uh, can work and um, be part of. And um, I guess, you know, there's a lot of funding that's gone into those corporations, um, you know, to put them through land management courses and, and different things. And, um, yeah, that that's... That I guess that's a, a bit of a platform for that. But there's also the ones that don't work at the corporations that 
um, we are always struggling to sort of uh, do the work that we want to do and be recognised. So, um, yeah, it's just we just keep going. Um, with my family, uh, we were involved in Tandem, uh for uh, the International Arts Festival opening in Melbourne and we did that for seven years, I think. Um, and now we haven't done that since COVID. Uh, and that was a ceremony that brought dance, it brought uh, uh, five of us um, from the Kulin Nations together with the Woiwurrung, the Jajawurrung, um, the Boomerang and um, the Tangarang uh, and uh, Wadawurrung. So it brought us all together. So for years we camped with the elders. Uh, we'd have dance practice every weekend for three months of the year. And, you know, this is hard work, what we were doing. And, um, and this is just to do a performance <laughs> and something that uh, we thought it was amazing because it's the first time, you know, since 200 years that we've brought this uh, uh, practice back. And uh, for Wadawurrung, we had like a Bayer, which is, um, you know, our Tandetum, which is a celebration of the coming together. But it was, part of that was, uh, you know, the language identity came into it and we took the kids out on country. We talked about the stories about the eels on our waterways um, and then we danced. Um, although we hadn't had those songs passed down to us, um, sometimes certain things happen to me. I dream of things and things just come. And um, I was speaking with one of the aunties last week at our emu workshop and uncle was there. Um, and sometimes things just come into your head and you speak the words and they, uh, we don't know where they come from, but she says to me, or oh, the ancestors, you know, the words are just coming from them. Um, and, you know, m my nan, you know, I look at those really strong matriarchs that I've had behind me, um, you know, that they've been really been really strong in that, in that space. But um, I think I went off the question. <laughs> we don't worry about questions here. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I think that was the question, Tammy. I think you answered that beautifully. And I think that's so important. And I think it's a really important thing for people who, non-Indigenous people who want to engage Indigenous people in their work and in what they do is that we need space for culture as well, that we need space to do things the right way, to have the right conversations, that we can't be boxed into a corner and tick a box type of thing, that true engagement and true reconciliation, if that's the word we're wanting to use, you know, we need that space to bring our whole selves along and that's not often the case. And that's, I didn't have a question, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add comment um, just quickly that bringing your whole, whole self to something is very difficult and... Um, I did a, a leadership program last year with the um, most deadliest women, Aboriginal women that I've ever met. And uh, walking away from that leadership program, they changed my life. Um, and they always said, uh, stand in your power. And when you fall, fall forward. Don't fall backwards. And um, whenever you're feeling afraid, just turn to your left and you'll see their ancestors here holding me, the long line of them. So I always, I hold on to that strength and um, that gets me through. And, you know, the work, I work seven days a week, <laughs> which I'm doing. I'm doing a, um, with the Career Heritage Trust, a, um, a course at the moment in black design. But our work doesn't stop. And when you're a traditional owner working and living on country, the pressure is um, ex exhillarated, like, you know, a hundredfold. It's always, uh, we're always, you know, for NAIDOC week and Reconciliation Week, we're always expected to be that person that will hold, um, you know, ceremony, welcome to country and that type of thing. But it's, it's very hard work. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for um, my ancestors, I, I don't think I'd survive, you know, them being so strong and um, being the people that they were. I think that's, you know, that is that feeling that you know I don't know I get it it's a little bit of wind on the back of my neck that uh that there's somebody there that it's it's this um you know what are these clues from country from ancestors that you're on the right path and I think that's so important to um you know ground us and and keep moving and even if it is 70 years in the future that we are on the right path that yeah, the the future that we can imagine but we'll never see um, will be and um, yeah 
Uncle Bruce, you've got any? any? No, just, just that we, um, yeah, Aboriginal people need to work together, um, not in opposition uh, to each other. And um, we can have uh, disagreements about things, but not on Facebook. Um, you know, have disagreements on, on camp and sort it out. Because um, if we're going to get to that 70 years, we, we can't be doing it um, over the false line in the sand that was created by something that happened, you know, in a house so long ago that it, no one remembers what it was. Um, and I don't like talking about this in open, um, open company, but um, we really do all need to have to work together. We can't, you know, d divided. We're, we're not, you know, white authority loves us being divided. They love us being divided because uh, then Twiggy Forest can go and um, do a deal with one part of us. Um, we, together we, we're very strong. But as a, a community, as an Australian community, we're also very strong. And um, uh, we need to think about that uh, when we're going to government, about what we want and about what we say. And um, when, when a mining tax is, is put forward, that we support it. We don't allow it to become a Mickey Mouse argument. Uh, it's about country. That argument about mining tax is about country. It's about Mother Earth. And Australians should have been more involved in it than they were. Um, so we, we have to, we're in it for the long haul. You know, um, Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people, we're wedded to each other. Um, we're in, in it for the long haul um, and we have to get along. Um, you know, the, those false divisions, you know, they've, they've been imposed on us by the, um, the trauma. I think it was you mentioned that trauma before. Um, and that trauma is real. Imagine losing a country that you had been passed down to you in law and you lose it like that one afternoon. You lose it. Um, imagine what that does to your mind and how that damaged mind then reverberates across the centuries and across the families. It's real, but we have to, we have to do something about it uh, together, um, Aboriginal people together. But then we have to turn to our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters and saying, listen, um, we know about this grass here. We know what it needs. We know about that forest there. We know what it needs, um, um, but we need your help. We need to do it with you, not... Um, not in isolation from you, and you no, know, not all Aboriginal people believe that. But I, I, I've experienced it, and I've seen how it can work, and I've seen how it doesn't work. And I, I much prefer things to work than not work. Um, I want, I want a future for my grandkids. I think that's a really powerful message, Uncle Bruce. And Tammy, do you have something you'd like to say? I think I'll just uh, say that when we burnt country, we burnt with our neighbours. And I think that, um, you know, together, like I'm working together, um, you know, that, that's, that's really powerful. And for me, when I'm out on country and we light that first um, patch of grass or area, it, it does something to your spirit. And that feeling is... It's um I I absolutely love it and I feel it's it's something that you I I don't know it's it connects us in a way that um I never thought would have been possible mm. it's it's good all around you know it's really you know and when we have that beautiful light smoke burning you know the the leaves are dancing and uh, Victor will say that you know the leaves dance and you know that's what we we like to see. Um, We burn um, and we smoke, um, uh, not for the colour of the smoke, but for the smell of the smoke. What it, what it's do, what it is doing to us and what it is doing to our family and uh, those around us. Because the smoke is a healer, and um, uh, so is the fire. Um, and we need to respect that um, what we're doing. And uh, on the farm, uh, we um, I say to the the young people who burn there I said if you can't walk backwards and forwards through that fire it's too hot um, you know 
I'm in the CFA, we've got PPE, helmets, all that sort of stuff. It's like we're going to war, and we really are. You know, that's, our, that's the attitude. We're at war with the country, so we've got to have the armour on. But true way, um, we can walk through that fire. And, um, I, you know, when my son was eight years old, we were walking backwards and forwards through fire. Now, the old people did it in bare feet um, because the fire was under such control that uh, you could literally walk through it. And um, that, that, that's a rule for this country, um, for southern, southeastern Australia. Uh, that's a rule. Uh, if you can't walk through it, put it out. I think that's a really powerful place to end our discussion tonight. And thank you both so much. This has been such a incredibly enriching and I feel a lot of hope for what we've spoken about, for the future of country, for working together, for walking through fire together as neighbours, as brothers and sisters and siblings um, and and that sort of hope for, for the future and respecting the past and all of the things that we still have to learn, which I'm really excited by, um, is this learning together um, and, and with, you know, everybody here as well is this walking together. Uh, so uh, would, I'd like for everybody to give our beautiful panellists a round of applause.